Hello, everybody, and welcome to Gen Conversations or Gen Con Roundtable. <laughs> I'm going to keep calling it that because it's the name that I came up with, and I am sorry. Hashtag not sorry. Um, I was just, I'm a sucker for puns, but it's wonderful to be here. We're going to be having a roundtable discussion today about educational games and or using games for education because they are related but slightly different concepts um, because surprisingly enough, a lot of games teach without necessarily intending to teach and we're gonna cover that as well today too. But I am joined by four wonderful individuals with a wealth of knowledge and expertise. So we're gonna bounce around and have a conversation between us, but chat as always, you are welcome and encouraged to post any questions that you have about this topic and I will facilitate making sure that uh, we address them over the course of our conversation today. Uh, so let's kind of go around and introduce everybody. Uh, feel free to introduce yourself, your role, and then maybe like a sentence about why you are here in some capacity. You know, I don't need your whole whole background. Um, for I'll start. I'll model it. Uh, my name is Lauren Oregovarin, Tuesday Online. I used to be a special education teacher and uh, I focused a lot on using games as a way to teach students concepts and topics. Uh, it was something that I'm very excited and passionate about. I also work with Gen Con and facilitate the streaming production side uh, of the Twitch. So that is why I am here and excited to talk about this. Uh, so we're, I'm gonna go around on this. I'm like looking at the Gen Con stream. We'll start with Marion. <laughs> And then we'll have like a clock. I was like, see what's happening on the Twitch page. <laughs> so, uh, hi, my name is Marion McBride. I'm, I'm an event manager for Gen Con. I've worked for Gen Con full time for about three years now, though I uh, did contracting and other work for them for a long time before that. I have an eight year old son. I'm sorry, nine year old. They grow so fast. Um, <laughs> and his first Gen Con was when he was eight months old. So he has grown up with gaming. I know it's been wonderful. Um, and so I'm here to talk about some of the games that we played when he was younger, that we play now, and that we'll hope to play with him in the future. Excellent. All right, we'll move over to Megan. All right. Hi, I'm Megan Culver. I am the Senior Director of Sales and Marketing at Gen Con. I have been here for almost 16 years. And the reason I'm here is because I have two kids one a 10 year old daughter and two an eight year old son uh my daughter's first gen con actually she was five weeks and <laughs> like yeah my my son's first gen con was when he was seven months so just like mary and mine mine have been growing up stressful. <laughs> it was incredibly stressful actually <laughs> I, but, I remember you bringing that bringing that yes. little baby yeah yep had, had the cover had my baby had my parents to hand her off to and and it all worked out <laughs> so <laughs> yes uh, and then we'll go down to Adam. And then so my name is Adam Davis. Uh, I was a public school teacher for two years as a literacy teacher. Uh, so actually, I think where I met Lauren the first time was through through some uh, education. You were contacts. a teacher, and when I first met you, and I was, I was. not a teacher yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, my my, I have a master's in education with a specialization in drama therapy, and I wrote my master's thesis about how collaborative play can reduce the symptoms. Of, uh, of bullying, which is uh, by, by mm. in improving friendships and allowing people to connect in a meaningful way that we can um, build a community with, that would uh, reduce bullying and improve the overall educational outcomes. Um, but what I'm most well known for is my association with Game to Grow. I was a founder of this uh, 501c3 non nonprofit that uses games in therapeutic groups. We have kids as young as eight and as old as early 20s. I have no kids myself. <laughs> Nor do I. <laughs> I am the child in this house. <laughs> I kid, I kid. Syra. Um, I'm Syra Benedict. I'm the senior operations manager at Gen Con. I've been there uh, for four years. Um, but before that, I was a middle school and high school social studies teacher for seven years. Um, and I have a five year old. So we can talk preschool games all day. <laughs> awesome. Yay. All right. So that is everybody here who will be talking today. Um, no, I need to say that. Uh, let's start with the first kind of major question, which is why? Why would why are a games games a way to teach or a good way to teach? Uh, why would we want to do this with our kids? Especially now, I think this is kind of relevant because a lot of people have children at home, and for many hours more in the day than they may have had them previously, uh, and what are ways that you can kind of provide these educational experiences um, and why might you want to do it through games rather than sitting down with a bunch of worksheets? 
does anyone want to jump in on that? Well, topic? it's, I mean, my, my main reason is just that it's, it's sort of sneaky learning, isn't it? It's uh, learning disguised as fun. So a lot of the games that we play uh, are fun and he, to win the game, he has to learn something. So he just learns it and he doesn't really think about it as being educational. So sneaky, it's a sneaky way <laughs> to learn. That's what I like. You can trick them into learning. <laughs> it's not as, yeah, it is kind of, yeah, fair enough. Fair and enough. It, it's a lot more fun, right? I think oh, it's, yeah. it's, it's a way to, to have your children engage. You know, like you said, there's a goal at the end of it. So they're thinking about how to win the game, right? Rather mm -hmm. than, oh, I have to learn how to count or I have to learn what that color is. So right. I think it, it just makes it a lot more fun. And for me personally, I don't like, you know, please do your math worksheet, please do this. So to say, let's sit down and play a game is a much less stressful way as a parent to teach your children. Yeah, absolutely. Have, have any of you found that it leads to kind of overall more positive uh, interaction, like interactions between you and the kids that you have been playing games with, uh, as opposed to where you might be kind of leading them in a more instructional way, like I'm teaching them more directly? I think this is sort of like the, the reading rainbow approach. Um, you know, I, I, I think uh, when, when you got it, when, when <laughs> kids have an opportunity to want to be present, um, they are going to be a lot more fully activated. Their brains are going to be online. They're going to be receptive and perceptive for everything that's going on. So if they want to be present in a game, they'll be picking up all of the incidental learning that comes from playing games. Whereas if you said, it's time for your worksheets. I doubt they would really be like, oh, I really want to sit at the table and do those worksheets now. Where yeah. if you said, we're going to continue the game that we paused earlier, it's time to Some continue. Some of us were those children. No. <laughs> <laughs> Some the of us were the worksheet. Well, depending on the worksheet, of course, uh, meaningful learning through worksheets. I'm not opposed to that concept. <laughs> but also, if you're playing a game with your teacher or with your parent, and then that teacher or parent you've built a meaningful relationship with through play says, it's time to do your worksheet, it's not the sort of overbearing adult mm -hmm. coming to frame everything for the kid. It's mm -hmm. an opportunity for meaningful interaction with now a mentor and a leader instead of someone who's determines what's right and wrong for you. Has anyone found uh, when kind of playing games with kids that their learning is better or more effective um, or different than uh, teaching through non-games? I think it puts, it puts the things that you're doing in a context, like, you know, with my son, like we can work on addition and we can, you know, cause that's what he's doing. But when we can do that in a game, he's got it automatically in a context where he has to use that skill for something other than just saying he knows that skill. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the same that we do when we bake together, when we, you know, walk down the street and count mm -hmm. whatever birds that we see, like anytime you can take that learning and put it into a larger context it's going to be more memorable and um and it's just going to help connect to other parts of learning as well instead of just having everything be compartmentalized great for sure i think what i uh, often found it was a great way of uh generalizing the learning that they might experience so like okay now i've taught you addition now you're going to practice that addition in that context, like you were saying. Um, mm -hmm. It also helps me as the adult practice those skills that I sometimes <laughs> get a little bit rusty at. D&D &D has allowed me to practice so much basic addition. <laughs> <laughs> right? It's pretty useful. Yeah. That, that's actually part of what makes a game so fantastic is there's in, in a true play environment, we have a continuation desire. We want to keep mm -hmm. the game going. And so if I have to slow down in order to read that thing, I'm going to start picking up my sight words a lot faster. I'm going to pick up words like dexterity yep. or action points or whatever those things are that I have to read that card to figure out what's going to make the game go faster. So my incentive to learn those words by sight is going to be so much faster. Or Lauren, you mentioned Dungeons and Dragons. Um, basic numeracy is a really important concept. Before you can get to higher level algebra and things like that, you have to be able to understand how numbers fit together. So in a game like Dungeons and Dragons, where you have a lightning bolt spell or a fireball spell, you have to roll eight six-sided dice. And then everyone has to wait for you to add those numbers together. <laughs> <laughs> and there are so many tricks you can do, and the game will reinforce this sort of naturally. But it's also an awesome opportunity for an adult to say, let me help you add numbers together faster. So mm -hmm. take all the pairs that add up to 10. 
And then now they're doing this sort of mental math trick, which is then gonna build into the next time they need to do mental math in another context. They now know how to add fours and sixes together to add to make 10 and hold that in their head while they find the two fives and add them together and make another 10. There's all these little sort of numeracy tricks that build on the literacy tricks from all the other referencing they have to do in the books. So thinking about the, the incidental learning that happens and then building on that as the, as the you know, facilitator of that experience is really valuable. So related to that though, what have, or what have people done if uh, say they're trying to play an educational game uh, or a game and kind of teach something and the child that they're playing with is somewhat resistant to that? Um, has anyone encountered strategies or things that have worked to kind of encourage uh, kids to engage in the learning side? I think at, at least in my house, there's sort of the end goal of, of the game, right? So we start to get frustrated and I'm like, hey, but if we can't figure this thing out, we don't, we're not able to get to the end, right? So do we want to accomplish this game, whether it be cooperative or individual, right? And I think a lot of times that's helped my kids. We may have to take a moment, take a break, right? But to be able to know that, that we're accomplishing something at the end is a little bit different than a worksheet, going back to that, right? Where it's like, ugh. I just that's so annoying. And yes, there's there's an end, but the end is not nearly as fun as when you end a game, right? Or you especially get to win. So I think that that you can motivate the kids a little bit differently when there's a different end goal. Very cool. All right. So I think we clarified why games are good. <laughs> They're more fun. Um, <laughs> let's kind of talk into some of the topic areas that we might look at uh, for games, like how uh, Let's kind of start with like what some of your current games are that you're either playing with your kids or, or, or with kids that you work with. Um, and what is it that you particularly like about those? We can kind of popcorn around for some uh, preferred games and also talk about whatever subject areas that that game can teach uh, or you have used it to teach, even if it's maybe not designed for that. Because <laughs> I've done a lot of that. Um, I can talk about one game that we're doing right now, which is for geography. This is actually a mass market game, so I haven't really seen it anywhere. It's not really a hobby game. This is called Great States. My son loves this game, and it's hard to see, but it's the entire map of the U.S. Oh wow! Okay. And um, each <laughs> one has each one has um, the capital, the city with the most population, their state flower, um, some other, a couple of other interesting things about its state bird, and uh, he has now learned all the states and all the capitals and he didn't even know that's what we were doing he was just having a great time answering these questions with mom and dad and let me show you that his favorite thing is the little buzzer right so um, <laughs> does that come with the game or did yes, you just give him that no, separately no let's include it it's all included you know and there's a little spinner thing and there's different questions and and i think because me and his dad uh and him, we're all, you know, we're all playing together and we're all excited about it. And before I knew it, like in a week, he learned all his states. And uh, it's a very simple game, but uh, it's, it's, it's hard to find, I think, games that teach geography like that. So this is a mm. game for that. And then, of course, the classic game for that. Um, so, Marion, really quick, yes. can I just, for, in, in terms of, of states, I mean, we, we really like the Scrambled States of America. Yeah, that's and, a good one. And it's a, it's a game right game. And it, it's just, it's such a fun little game because you have a little map in front of you and the cards. And it doesn't talk as much about some of the state facts, but it's, it's also talking about location, right? Find a state that's west of this one or touches yeah. the ocean, right? Or, or things like that. And, and that makes it really fun and interesting. And same with my kids. We, before, you know, we got homeschooling materials, I was printing out blank maps and having them write the states, you know, and, and where they were. And they actually knew where most of the states were because we had been playing that game and they were used right. to seeing it on that map. So I, I actually think geography games are really fun, but like you said, they're harder to come by. I agree. Um, anyone else have any geography games while we're on that? <laughs> we can go by topic well, area. Well, I know you've got that. I know you've got 10 days there to hold up speak of the 10 days and, and you have 10, 10 days, days in the usa right yeah but this is a whole series some of them are out of print but i believe they're going to be reprinting some of them soon there's like 10 days, 10 days in Africa, europe is very fun europe. and it's basically I'm not just, familiar oh yeah it, it, it's well it's a, you can see it's just a basic map of the united states and you it's very simple you just have to plot a course 
Um, and it, it has to do with the colors and matching and the plane can be, you know, from a blue state, you can pick a blue plane, that, that kind of thing. Very basic, very simple. Um, but again, they're gonna learn their states and they're gonna learn where they are. Um, so I like this game. Uh, it's, it's real, yeah. adults like this game too, that's the thing. This is kind of fun for I've, adults too. I've only played it with adults. <laughs> I've oh, not even go. tried it with kids yet. And yeah, there's a whole series of them. There's 10 yeah. Days in Europe Sounds and like Asia the, and Africa. According to chat, it has been reprinted. So that's good to know. Oh, I also um, kind of related to this. Is there any games that people have used that are not strictly educational? Like I definitely learned a lot more about American geography from like Ticket to Ride um, mm -hmm. or other kind of yeah. similarly concepted games. Like chat also brings it up um, mm -hmm. at the same time. But yeah. that's what I was just like, Wait, Winnipeg? Like what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Ticket to Ride's one that we play. Um, and my son is almost ready for it. He's getting there. Um, you know, Do we're, you have the, we're a little first my first journey one. There's a I don't. Okay, okay. So I don't. that might be um, start with that. Yeah. yeah. So we're you know, we're a little limited by his reading ability right now or lack thereof. So um, so that's where we are with with games, but I know that the geography ones are going to be ones that he's going to really like once we get there. I guess we did sort of skip ahead. No, yeah, that's in, right. In let's have, of, actually let's touch on yeah. uh, kind of reading and math. I think are probably two like core skills that we see in a lot of games. Um, yeah. So you sort of mentioned that um, your son is maybe not as fluent or proficient of a reader as you're hoping, or he's still learning um, he's five. he yeah. doesn't read yet <laughs> like, maybe not hoping but just you know how um kind of two really good questions one are there games that people have particularly like to use to teach reading uh, or teach reading related skills uh, and kind of related to that how do you support um less uh less or less readers uh kids who are not as strong in reading in playing games that may be useful for other skills uh but how do you scaffold that for them? So yeah, so we have those. quite a collection of games that are good for pre-readers. Um, and some of them are um, kind of, so what I want, kind of good stepping stones to other games that also don't require a lot of reading skills. If you've got older kids who struggle with reading but don't really want to play like baby games anymore. Um, so like, for example, uh, one of our kind of favorite ones is Tiny Park, which is very um, spatial reasoning and how do you fit these tiles together on your, um, on your board, but is um, a very good practice for other games that are more complicated in their spatial reasoning, like Bear Park or Planet or things like that that you're, you know, if you have a struggling reader who's older, who is not going to be interested in a game that looks like this, there are lots of other kind of spatial reasoning games that just don't require those reading skills and have more complex, like strategies and rules and stuff to them, which, you know, we're not playing yet with five-year-old, but, yeah, yeah. um, but we're practicing because those are mama's favorite games. So <laughs> he's learning those skills now. <laughs> you got to get him ready. You yeah. Get him ready. And then the other one that, um, you know, memory games are really mm. big with preschoolers and there's hundreds of them, like oh, find yeah. your kid's favorite thing and get a memory game of it. But we were getting kind of over that and um, our wonderful friends at Haba who make all my favorite games introduced me to this little guy, Rally Run, oh, which right. is kind of like a next level memory game. Um, you're using tiles to create a track that your car can go on from point A to point B. But after you place the next tile, the tile you just came off of gets flipped over upside down. And eventually you have to get back to point A. So you have to kind of remember what you built so that you can then backtrack. So once you get kind of past the basic, like you found the mommy and the baby and you matched them, yay. This is a good um, kind of next step in those memory games. Anyone else have other reading or reading related games? I think it's hard to use a game to teach reading, at least in, in my house. You know, one game that we really like is Apples to Apples Junior. And I think one nice thing about that is 
you can, you know, help them, right, by, by reading the words, right? And if they're just doing the answer, it's only one word. So it's a little bit easier, right, than a bunch of words. So we found that that actually was kind of fun for early readers. But in general, I, I can't say that I have a game that I'm like, yes, that really helped my kids learn how to read. Because I think that we used, you know, games that were appropriate at the level that they were at. So if they didn't know how to read, yeah. like Cyrus said, we played yeah. certain yeah. games. Once they did know how to read, we played that next level, you know? I've definitely found Apples, Apples to Apples Jr., get the junior version. Um, <laughs> honestly, use that version for adults too. And there's some words in there that I'm always like, hmm, why? I don't need those. Um, but uh, was really good for vocabulary for my students. Mm. I was working with middle schoolers. Um, and uh, like, if I was facilitating the game, I could look at everybody's cards and kind of help them learn words that they may be able to read, but not know the meaning of. Um, so good for point. slightly older kids, especially ones trying to pick up new vocabulary words, um, is a good way for them to kind of, that was a, a lot of success that I had. They all loved it. So I was like, great, we're gonna keep playing this game. <laughs> I would also suggest looking at games that have words and pictures of what the, those things that the words mm. represent, because then you're providing the player the connection between what that mm. word is and what it means. Um, Flux is a really great example of this. Um, mm. Flux is one of my favorite games that we use in, in the more therapeutic groups because it requires such a level of flexibility. Um, so there's a lot of, of sort of academic skills that aren't technically, you know, reading, writing, arithmetic type skills that can be mm -hmm. built in a lot of these games too. Um, like, you know, spatial reasoning and things like that. Um, but flux is great because it says moon and then has a picture of the moon. It has milk yeah. and has a picture of milk, which then provides that really quick association. So I would say those those kinds of games um, where the reading is also tied to your win condition. If you can't read that word and connect the dots, then you might not necessarily understand how to win the game. So then you're providing, once again, that sort of meaning built into it. Mm -hmm. um, we also, uh, when I was a teacher, we played the game um, Once Upon a Time. And oh, I think I know that one. It's a card game, right? It's a card game, yeah. but the goal is to build a story together. Mm -hmm. And so then you're tying literacy, not just into words and sight association with what those words mean, but also connecting words into the meaning of them in a, in a more narrative context. And we, we learn as people um, mm -hmm. through narrative, right? We learn through, through stories we have since we were around fires, um, learning through stories uh, as cave people. So I think um, remembering so that the power of narrative when we're playing these games too. And also I will just add um, as a drama therapist, the power of your physical affect when you play these games. Um, a pretty boring game can be made really exciting for everyone who's playing it if everyone leans in and pretends that it is more fun than it actually is. We actually can <laughs> make it more fun. Um, and really good games can be very unfun to play when people are you know, looking at their phones, no matter how good the game mechanics are, if we aren't fully present with each other, we won't enjoy them. And when I was a kid, I played a lot of um, Brain Quest, I think is what it was called. Um, yep. It's really just trivia, mm -hmm. but it's presented in these little mm -hmm. fan things. I think it's Brain Quest, right? Yeah, and I think I know the, yeah, the one like the, yeah. they were like these sticks and you would like fan them out and then, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah had it's those just, like, car on road trips. Exactly, it's just <laughs> trivia. There's not even a game there, um, but, Trivia can be made into a game if you're playing. And the way we would play it is a person who had it would always like look behind the fan like this. And they were the sort of <laughs> quiz master. And then it took on this sort of otherworldly presence. It wasn't just asking someone for a discrete answer to a discrete question. It was like, welcome to my lair. I'm going to keep you prisoner until you answer my five questions. And now it's a there's a success criteria to answering. And now I'm a game master professionally. But <laughs> <laughs> I can yeah, connect the dots. I see how you got from A to B. So one other game I was just thinking of that's not reading but vocabulary is Taffle. And I don't know if you guys have ever played, but you know, it has the letters around the ring and it's a, a subject. So fruit, for example, yep. right? And then you'd say apple and hit A and then hit the timer. And then the next person has to go orange and hit the O and then timer. Well, it gets harder as you lose the letters, right? And so it really makes you think quickly, right? And you're thinking about, okay, what does that word, what does it start with? So we really like playing that with our kids and our friends' kids too. And as a, as a group, right, with other families, because adults think it's fun and kids think it's fun. So it's a way that you can bring all ages together to play a game that is not really educational, but at the same time has an educational element. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I think we, um, chat also brings up uh, code names. I think there are versions of code names that have pictures on the cards to go with the words, but I'm not 100% sure. Uh, that, depending on the age yeah. of, the, of yeah. the kids that you're working with, that would, I would either err on the side of having ones with pictures or ones 
with just words. I'm not sure. I also use code names in the groups that I run. Um, mm -hmm. The base version just has the words on them. Yeah. Right. And the pictures version just has pictures. And the okay. pictures are always kind of zany. So it's, you yeah. can't say snowman. It's like snowman wearing a hat with a bird flying through it. Yeah. Um, so it'd be hard to turn that in. <laughs> I, I almost, the thing, well, at least when I've played code names, the thing about code names is a lot of it depends on sort of the relationship you have with the people that play. Mm -hmm. If you sort of know how you think, mm -hmm. then uh, you'll do better with them. Uh, and I worry that that might frustrate some younger kids, particularly. Uh, For sure. I could be wrong. But That's why I use it in my groups. Actually. Oh, okay. To, to, we'll, we'll, to get to, we'll get to <laughs> non-academic skills. Yeah. I use that because they're very important still. Mm. Um, so we kind of covered some numeracy. Some Do we have any other math uh, related? We haven't covered numeracy. No, we covered yeah. geography and reading. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so kind of numeracy, the other sort of big category uh are there specific math focused or games that tie math in that people have had success with or particularly enjoy i mean i just initially i want to say that almost every game involves math even if you're just rolling <laughs> now count three now you've got three plus seven what is that i mean dungeons and dragons any role playing any board game fundamentally involves math so whatever else you're learning from that you're learning math too which is mm -hmm. great even Candyland, you have to count. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, so maybe our, not the original version. Maybe that was the adapted version that one of our teachers <laughs> did, made them answer um, math questions. Yeah, I think right. originally it was just the color. The you just, just had to go to the next color. color. Yeah. I guess like snakes and ladders, you do still have to count. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. Yeah. Not that I recommend first... those games, which is <laughs> a whole other thing. Our first ones that we used um, with our son that he's now even outgrown really at five were um, the sneaky snacky squirrel game. <laughs> um, so that had some real kind of basic counting in it. You know, are you getting one acorn off the tree or two? And there was some good kind of fine motor skills with it. It comes with like this squirrel tweezer that you use <laughs> to get the acorns and so that was you know really good for his little three-year-old hands to kind of work with um and then uh the some of the early some of the my first games from haba especially first orchard was oh, a yeah. good one with him with some early counting and again really big um really big wooden pieces that were fruit that he could grab and move um you know and he was like two and three yeah. when we were playing those games. And now that we're starting to get into some really kind of early edition with him, we are playing not from Haba. Uh, <laughs> oh my gourd is what we are playing, no <laughs> which just makes me laugh every time I say mm -hmm. the name of it. It's a Robin's Burger game. And you, um, everybody has their own gourd that they're growing. So someone's got a pumpkin and someone's got a, watermelon or whatever and you grow pieces of it but you grow it by having cards that add up to like you know you have to either have these cards that match or these cards that add up to six or the so um there's a lot of kind of different conditions he has to keep in his mind and he's learning to look at his cards and add them without having to always ask you know other people to help him add, because you're not necessarily supposed to be showing all your cards and stuff like that. So, um, so that's our that's our current early edition game. Anyone else specific things they have liked to use for math skills or math related skills? I, one of the ones I'm curious about if anyone has experience with it is um, uh, not just addition and subtraction, because I feel like we get a you can get a lot of those very fundamental skills right. uh, through mm -hmm. like RPGs or anything that roll dice, add numbers together. Um, but uh, have they have any of you utilized or experienced using uh, games in order to teach like higher level skills, like even probability or multiplication, division, uh, kind of any of those math concepts? Well, we're, we're just kind of there in fifth grade, right? I mean, you know, and it's not really my daughter's favorite thing. So we tend not to do that when we're playing games. Um, but I would say one thing that we haven't spoken about is currency, right? And not yeah. something that my second grader is learning a lot about, right? And so we have an allowance game and we have Monopoly. And those have been two games where they have to learn how to count. And in allowance, they actually have little coins, so not only are you doing the, the bills, but you're doing the coins and, and how much those are and counting them and then 
how many, how many coins add up to a dollar, right? So something as simple as that is really nice. Cool. Very nice. Any other math? Blackjack. Topics? That's how we're going to teach probability. <laughs> That's actually okay. a really solid way to teach it. I played a lot of blackjack with my grandmother growing up, and I got <laughs> pretty good at it. And that was, once again, <laughs> the desire to win. And we played with M&Ms, so it wasn't like we were yeah. really yeah. gambling, but... I don't know. Losing out on M&Ms does feel pretty bad. <laughs> also, the <laughs> out M&Ms were worth five, so then there was a little bit of that, you know, okay. skill set that can build into four quarters into a dollar, you know. Yeah. I see the the suggestion um, of Yahtzee as well. That's definitely yeah. oh. a good one. Um, yeah. I think one of the things, and I haven't talked about, I haven't didn't do this so much, but I have a Yahtzee right here. And you can look at things like uh, <laughs> just dice sets are really good for explaining different values and probabilities. Like I'm rolling a D4, I have a one in four chance versus a D6 versus a D8. Um, and even just playing those sort of RPGs, you get that feeling of like rolling the D20 is much harder for me to do this than maybe if I was rolling a different die. Um, so you can kind of play around with some of those concepts too. That's 100% how I taught probability as a teacher. I brought mm -hmm. in my husband's like D and D dice set and I was like, all right. And I pulled it out and like five of the boys in my class, they were like, your husband's a nerd. Those are D and D dice. Yes. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. and, uh, but that's, yeah, that's 100% how we, how we taught probability. There's, uh, there's some, some times in Dungeons and Dragons, I mean, Dungeons and Dragons is the game I play the most of, so I could talk a whole lot about the power of D&D, &D. but e <laughs> even in there, there's so much probability built in there because you have some choices about whether you want to use a 12-sided die or two six-sided dice. Mm -hmm. the maximum is the same, but the average is different. Yeah. So it's very, the minimum is different too. So it's very, it's very exciting for the kids to try to problem solve this because they're trying to say, do I want to be more likely to get the high number or do we want to be more likely to get a middle number somewhere in there, but also rolling more dice is lots of fun. So mm -hmm. there's all these back and forth things where once again, it's tying, tying into the meaning behind it, not just the, you know, just, not just the skills, but not the just, skills. I can write this fraction. Exactly. Um, so let's kind of bridge. We've done sort of math and numeracy. Um, let's kind of talk about maybe, and feel free to jump back to any of the other sort of more academic subjects, but um, I want to make sure we touch on uh, not strictly academic skills. Uh, I use air quotes because I was a, a behavior teacher. Uh, so this was basically all I taught. Uh, <laughs> it was like every academic skill was realistically, this is what we're actually teaching. So what are some um, other skills? And the two major ones I can kind of think about are social skill or three, maybe social skills, um, physical skills, uh, any games that kind of address those aspects like manual dexterity, uh, and then also some more higher level or critical thinking skills. Um, so does anyone want to jump in on one of those topics? Uh, we can, <laughs> I see props. Dexterity so like games. Hey, <laughs> dexterity game. Um, everyone's favorite. Uh, again, a hobby game, uh, animal upon animal, or a tier or tier, because I have a German one, but it doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> And uh, this has actually been fun for me. This is fun for my friends. Um, and you basically roll a die, and depending on that is how many animals you stack on top of the alligator. Um, it is, I think, great for kids for um, not only working on, but evaluating their fine motor skills, right? Mm -hmm. So um, ta -da! Uh, you don't need any uh, reading. And it's a little challenging for the adults too. I'm not gonna lie. So um, look like it. I think I think this is this. I think this game particularly is great for fine motor skills. There's others we do as well. Uh, Talk Talk Woodsman is a big favorite. If you guys know that one, you basically have a giant tree log, a tree log, and you hit the side of it, and parts of the bark fall off. Uh, he enjoys that very much. Um, but I, I, you know, those are the games I think he finds the most fun because they seem like pure fun to him, but. Mm -hmm. We're also practicing these skills that he's going to need later. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, we are doing uh, Catch the Moon is our dexterity that. game right. that we play. And, you know, we're not as, like, hard on our five-year-old with the rules of it as we are with each other. Like, oh, that ladder is, that little corner <laughs> of it is touching a thing. Like, you know, we don't do that with him. But, um, but that, you know, that grasp, grasping things and being able to stack them lightly, like, that is so important for kids as they're learning how to write and how to hold their pencils properly and 
just any of those things that build those fine motor skills are hugely important and way more fun than here. Let's practice holding your pencil. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. And my son has those little pencil grips. He doesn't want to use them, but you know, he'll play that game with me. So it's great. So two that I used, and I use these with middle schoolers, the classic Jenga uh, is, is a great one because it also also requires, um, we also kind of used it for social skills because it did sort of dual duty to help students. Like, you know, you got to pull the block here, but also you're not allowed to touch the table and that kind of yeah. respect and like showing that respect to other people to, you know, have the hands off and, and not touching the table. Uh, and then reverse Jenga, as I like to call it, which is suspend. Um, where you oh, have yeah. metal rods and you're sort of hanging them all on all of these other rods and trying not to let mm-hmm. it fall down. Um, so those would be two of my go-tos that I think are, uh, that worked really well for kind of the middle schoolers that I was playing with. My, my son loves to spend as well. Um, he's he's terrible fun. at it, <laughs> but I am also terrible at it. So it works out well. And it's, it's funny, do. that's a Melissa and Doug get, uh, game, right? So you wouldn't normally think of it. I've actually seen that reviewed on the Dice Tower, which is a really popular uh, board game review channel, and they loved it. So it's really great for adults or kids or combination. I was actually going to mention that when I have a good friend who's a therapist who uses suspend as a metaphor to talk about being overburdened and being out of balance. And it's yeah. it's a great ah. game I'll just in in the context of, of um, using games to connect with your family anyway, if we're sort of stuck inside with them during COVID. Um, it's really nice to use a game to sort of open up a conversation that may be um, a little harder to have if you're just wanting to have a direct face-to-face conversation. But if you can bring in uh, some some of these elements of being out of balance or being overwhelmed, then that opens up that conversation space pretty nicely too. Um, mm-hmm. The other game, but I don't remember the name of it. It's another dexterity game that I used to play when I worked at the zoo um, where there's magnetic snake eggs that you have to put down. Does anybody mm-hmm. remember no, no, what game I'm talking about? I think it was, I don't remember what it's called, something about snake eggs. Um, but the, each egg is this oblong sort of oval shaped magnet. And because magnets attract and, and repel each other, you're supposed to place them down on this board based on the, the, the dice that you roll. And then they, of course, will clang together. And it's, uh, you have to be very careful not to, you know, to point it in the right direction. So there's building in some basic science, mm-hmm. even though there's no actual science knowledge being imparted it's just understanding that magnets attract and repel each other it's a fantastic game as well oh, yeah a point that oh that's it's a it's like dungeon dexterity one it literally is like a dungeon crawler board game but you have to manually throw things at a board in order to like score a certain number of points I'm trying to remember what it's <laughs> called but that's one that i would play with my friends in college hmm. um <laughs> so i'm yeah. also pretty sure it would work well for slightly older um, yeah. too. yeah i was just gonna say to the point of you know, Adam, what you were just talking about with, with sort of the, you know, conversation piece, it's something that I, I don't think we've, we've talked about that I think it's important is, is playing games with your children also allows you to spend time with them and communicate with them, right? I noticed sometimes over a game, a conversation will come up because we're doing something in a, in a game and it'll bring up, oh, this thing happened at school or I had this interaction or maybe you wouldn't want to handle it that way, right? So I think that's something really important too that, that games bring to the table is just, conversation and and how you might be able to more comfortably bring something up or use it as an example right so Mm -hmm. and and even even if that that thing you're doing together is a puzzle I mean it can just be something you do together where you're sitting around a table together where you just reduce the anxiety of looking at someone in the face and addressing your personal issues I used to play the game labyrinth when I was probably six years old with my mom Mm -hmm. it's a Ravensburger game um and I actually got a chance to meet the CEO of Ravensburger America and got to tell him that that I I loved um, Labyrinth and, and we got to connect around that. And that was one of the things that he mentioned to me was that's the goal for a lot of their, their games is to have people be able to play together. And, and when a, a kid can beat a parent, when the parent is trying hard and the kid can still beat the parent, that is a really good game for a family to play together because I could beat my mom and it wasn't in that moment, my mom got to practice her frustration tolerance at times <laughs> and model what it looks like to not yeah. you know, flip the table over when the six-year-old beats her, when mm-hmm. she's trying, right? It's, mm-hmm. it's a really important familial space to get into where then I could come to my mom later and say, hey, this thing happened at school. I want to talk to you about it because we have this relationship now. I think that actually segues us kind of pretty nicely into um, uh, more social skills that we might uh, Mm -hmm. 
uncover or play through, uh, mm -hmm. learn through games. Uh, any particular games that people have found successful for teaching those or experiencing those um, beyond the sort of obvious like learning to, to win and to lose are really mm -hmm. important skills that you learn when you play a game. <laughs> Yeah, I feel like I've said a lot of times, you have to wait your turn. It's not your turn yet. So that, that's pretty universal for any game. Uh, so we have to be patient. We have to respect other people. And, you know, we have to obey the law, the rules of the game, right? So that's, that's universal that every game is teaching them. Yeah. Similar to that, one of the things I would find is um, the kind of the flip side of taking turns is paying attention when it is not your turn. Uh, uh, true, making true. sure students were still able to do that so they would know that it is their turn to go uh, when it is actually their turn. That's that's sort of, I think that's a good one for adults to practice too. No, that, that's a really good point because my son does at times have trouble focusing. So um, I, I think so. a way to, sorry, one just to, to talk about that skill are cooperative games, right? That's a great way to teach your children how to communicate and just because you think it's the right way to accomplish that goal doesn't mean that someone else is, right? And so you have to compromise and you have to understand and you have to hear them. And so I think cooperative games can be very good, not just for children, for adults as well, but you know, to, to learn some of those skills or practice some of those skills. Uh, do you have particular cooperative games you enjoy or recommend? So I'm I'm a huge fan of mole rats in space. That is actually I'm not a big <laughs> part of it. That person. sounds amazing. It's it's such a cute game, and they're in space, and they have to get past little snakes and and pick up some aids, and it's it's super fun. <laughs> oh. it, seriously, it, it is absolutely amazing. Uh, it is a peaceable kingdom game. Yes, yeah, it's my favorite. Cool. Peaceable well, kingdom in general is really good for those cooperative yep. games. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would say that the cooperative game that my son likes most right now is Stop Thief. Mm -hmm. um, it's an, an old game. I think it's from the 70s, but Restoration Games came out with a new version of it recently. And they came out with new uh, cards for cooperative play. Uh, and basically, if nobody knows it, uh, you have an app. You used to have this old weird looking cell phone thing that <laughs> you're trying to find the thief where he's gone on a big map with a pattern. And so you all have to work together listening to sounds to figure out it, where the thief is and go and try to catch him. And you're all working together. Um, mm -hmm. That's a lot of fun. I've gotten a lot of people to play that that aren't gamers. And I think one of the things my son really likes about it is that his theory of deductive reasoning is just as valid as ours. Cause you know, we'll say like, we heard these three sounds so he could be here or here. And my son will be like, I think, couldn't he also be here because of those sounds? And we're like, yes. So, mm -hmm. Um, not to segue too hard, but I think that, that <laughs> that's a great cooperative game that also teaches him uh, some deductive reasoning skills mm -hmm. and that he can participate in a meaningful way. So that's, mm -hmm. that's one of his top games right now. That's great. Um, any other cooperative games people particularly like? Adam? I'm writing down all these games. I'm just wanting to <laughs> celebrate I'm, the fact that I'm learning a lot right now. <laughs> I love co-op games. Um, <laughs> my, my family plays a lot of them um, because it works well for my family. Uh, but yeah. the one we played the most was Pandemic. And I'm just like, I'm yeah. not in the mood for that right now. <laughs> so I, any of us I, are. My son likes that very much. And we haven't played it in months. We, we played it in January. And he yeah. loved it. And then we just played away. Good game. Can't say I want to play it right now. Nope. Forbidden nope. Island and Forbidden, Forbidden Desert I are basically so Pandemic without the, the um, complexity and thematic elements that may be unfortunate. I will right say uh, the Forbidden... Sky City one, the the latest one, I haven't played that. The rocket ship, so just see that. Put that out <laughs> there if you want to want a rocket ship to go with your game. <laughs> um, there are a, a lot of social skills um, that are built through any game at all that aren't just like a, a game that specifically focuses on, on that thing. And I think that's another one of these like really important concepts is that when a kid, especially one that's identified as maybe needing some extra support in these social skill areas, starts playing a social skills game, they're going to probably push that game away um, unless it is 
a fun and engaging play experience. So it's just really important to remember when, you know, just the, the same thing with an academic game. If we were to say, we're gonna play a game to help you learn math, um, that might instantly throw up red flags that say, this is not a real game. This is a pretend mm -hmm. game that's disguising itself as a game. Yeah. <laughs> and a lot, of, a lot of educational or therapeutic games are the same way. Uh, but there are a lot of games out there that actually also provide all of the capacity to build a lot of those same skills. So we, we mentioned earlier, a lot of games teach um, turn-taking. A lot of games just inherently do that. Um, a lot of games really inherently teach perspective taking, which is a really important social skill, one that we focus on a, a lot. Um, we have a lot of young people on the autism spectrum and that's an identified area that they need some extra support with. So games like code names are perfect for this because in order to be good at code names, you have to identify that someone else has different thoughts, feelings, and experiences than we do, and then use that as a game mechanic. So then once again, we're building that into the game. Um, and a lot of young people we play with really, really struggle with this because they will put together the words and make the perfect clue that has something to do with an obscure anime that only they have seen. Yeah. <laughs> and it is the perfect clue if you have seen you know, episode four of season three of that show. Um, but if you have it, then it's it's a terrible clue. And I, I can model this. Another really nice thing about this game is that I can also model giving really bad clues. Um, so I can choose, uh, to, to, for those of you that aren't familiar with code names, there's uh, 25 cards on the table. Um, your job is to give a clue to identify specific cards on the table that the other team has to guess or your other, other parts of your team have to guess. And I put together the clue, um, or the, the it was well, Field and dog. I said Lassie. Brilliant clue. <laughs> Lassie runs across the field. She's a dog and she helps Timmy who's dropped in a well. It's a brilliant clue. Nobody has seen Lassie. Nobody understands that. <laughs> I, so I would have gotten it. I appreciate but I'm that. I'm old. <laughs> but I, I don't think that. a group of 10 year olds would. Well, they would no. Not. Yeah. no, they all kind of just looked at me. And then I used this as an example where I could, you know, model what it looks like to go, oh gosh, I was thinking about my thoughts, feelings, and experiences and not yours. And now here we are. Well, guess whatever you can. I think they got dog, um, but that was, that was it. Um, but that, that, that game is just relies on perspective taking skills. Um, there is another game that I really love uh, that I play a lot called Snake Oil. And heard of it. Snake Oil is a fantastic game. Um, it's a it's similar structure to, um, to apples to apples where one person is sort of the judge who then decides mm -hmm. between everybody else's offerings. But the way that snake oil works is one person draws a card that is the, 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 the customer, I guess. And the customer always has a personality. Um, it's like a caveman or a grave robber or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then everyone else draws uh, a hand of cards that all are nouns. And some of the nouns can be used as adjectives, also a great literacy skill. Um, and then they pitch something to sell to that customer. So it would be like laser ah. shovel. This is my you know, I have played this, yes. dungeon towel or whatever. And then the, the customer hears all of their pitches and it's, you know, we set a timer for one minute and everybody pitches to the, to the caveman. What does the caveman want? And that, you know, they can, I think the, my, my favorite was a tongue towel sold to a vampire <laughs> um, for, you know, when you're done. Yeah, you gotta clean, clean your mouth. <laughs> and uh, and yeah. it's, it's just a theory of mind game. Um, but you're not necessarily using it for a person to person, using it for the character. So it provides mm -hmm. some of that distance that makes it less maybe aggressive than my lassie, a uh, bad clue given game. <laughs> Poor Timmy, yeah. oh, isn't that well? Mm -hmm. uh, so before we kind of wrap up the part of like specific games, are there any other games that people want to touch on? Cause then I kind of want to just go into a little bit more general like tips and tricks to, to do this. I very much want to mention an old an oldie but a goodie called Mastermind, which is, this is for kids, they have other versions, uh, which is amazing for deductive reasoning. Uh, if you don't know it, go look in your parents' closet because they probably have it. It was very popular <laughs> in the 70s. Um, and you can kind of see here, uh, one person is the code maker and they make a secret code of three different colors for this one and there's a four and a five. <laughs> What? I'm never playing this. You remember playing this? I played it incessantly. Yes. In your parents, it's in your parents' closet or attic right now, I guarantee. But uh -huh. for my my son loves it, and we actually have graduated to the four now. This is the old one we used to play with the three. Uh, I think it's amazing for deductive reasoning. It shows it because he puts a pattern, and, and you you look at what you've made as the code maker, and you say whether something's the correct color, 
And then there's a different way to say if it's the correct color and in the correct space, right? Mm -hmm. So it is amazing to watch him sort of figure out and by process of elimination and just deduction, figuring out what the actual code is. And um, he loves to play this with me. We have played this for hours at a time. Just back and forth, we alternate code maker and code breaker. Um, so I really Your mastermind recommend... for kids needs a new home, Marion. <laughs> oh, yeah. it's, it, look, it's, it's had a lot of wear. Um, I'm oh, happy okay. to lend it to you if you want. But, but quite honestly, any thrift store you go in, if you don't have it, it's probably got three or four copies of it. When they're open again. <laughs> yeah. I know. I know. But I just, I just wanted to shout that out. Any last games people want to make sure they mention and they bring up first? One other game I'll throw out. We, we talked earlier about Monopoly. Mm. And I personally, I think I might have talked to you about this before, Lauren. I hate Monopoly um, <laughs> immensely. Um, but what's great about Monopoly is that it actually teaches, because I think it's I think it's a really unfun game for my preferences. So whenever I played it, I cheated. Oh. Uh, I just got really good at cheating. And it... <laughs> Um, I firmly believe it's another skill. <laughs> Carol, right? are we, are we advertising that cheating is a good thing? <laughs> here, no, no, no. But here's, here's the thing. Here's the thing about that is that what it did really well for me and for the people that I was playing with is it taught us how to deal with cheaters. Um, oh. How do we respond in this situation when mm -hmm. we all know that people are going to try to do that thing where we kind of do the grift, where we put down the wrong number of cash and pull it back. Everybody's going to do that. We all just had an understanding. We're all seven we're gonna do it um well, maybe... crowd at seven <laughs> my yeah. children are watching this by the way so you're teaching them bad things <laughs> no 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 what I'm, what I'm saying is it's a great game to learn how to navigate not only if you are someone who wants to deal with the moral conundrum of cheating in a game but also how do you deal with it when when you catch someone doing that what do we how do we prioritize the, the community and how do we prioritize the play over caring about whether you got boardwalk or not what we what we really want to do in this structured space mm -hmm. through a game is is engage in meaningful connection with each other and what do we do when that gets disrupted and how do we put it back together again i think that is a fundamental social skill we build through mm -hmm. lots of games but i think monopoly is particularly good about that certainly in my own experience teaching how to deal with cheaters I, and that i make fun but that is very <laughs> So Maybe. Megan, you should cheat Cheating next time wrong. you play Monopoly because that will be important learning <laughs> opportunity for your children. <laughs> See if they catch me. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, that's a whole nother skill too. Um, so there's kind of two last questions I want to go. We we started a little bit late, so if it's all right with everyone here, we'll we'll run a little bit late too. Um, so uh, two big things that I want to make sure we touch on is uh, general games that are good for kind of multi ages or the whole family, like a lot or, or different age groups. I ran across this a lot working with um, multi age classrooms. I would be teaching sixth, seventh and eighth graders at the same time and kind of playing games with all of them. Uh, and also similarly, kids working at a lot of different academic levels. So any recommendations for games that uh, people either enjoy playing with their family or have found really successful for kind of working with multiple skill levels or ages. So one of our favorites is Ubongo. It's a, a Cosmos game and we've had it forever. I personally am a huge Tetris fan and it, it's very much like Tetris. You have a, a certain shape and you have to roll and you get your pieces and you have to fit those pieces in before someone else. So when my kids were younger, we would you know, we wouldn't time it. It didn't matter who won. It was just a matter of, of getting those pieces in. And there's a three side and a four side. But then as they you know get older, you can actually play more competitively. And, and again, personally, I have a lot of fun with it because I enjoy that type of a game. But really, you can pretty much play with any age once a child understands how you put a puzzle together. Mm -hmm. Any other family or multi-age games people want to... Oh. I think the key with multi-age games is just finding games that everybody can play to their full extent. Mm -hmm. And and I think there are a lot of games like that, even, even games that are meant to be more, you know, little kid games. Um, if you find those ones that, you know, are simple enough that your youngest players can grasp the strategy, but there is some strategy so that your adults and your older kids aren't getting bored. Um, that's really the key because you don't, you know, you don't want anything where your youngest players are always going to lose because they just can't keep up. 
Yeah. And you don't want ones where your your older players are going to be like, okay, well, we've won three times in a row, so now we got to let the little one win. Like that gets old real fast too. So, um, so that's kind of the key is just finding those, and you can find them. You'll find them in adult games, and you'll find them in kids games. Yeah. And so just being open to um, the ages outside of what's written on the box, and mm-hmm. um, and knowing that you may you may find something that you really love that you that you wouldn't think of because it wasn't really like marketed for you. Mm-hmm. I have to say, I feel, I know we've mentioned them to death here, but I think that Haba games generally do a really good job of making games that are interesting for both kids and adults, right? Um, they're almost never, I'm going to roll and move three spaces. Oh, I lost, blah, blah, right? There's something <laughs> going on. There's something more interesting. Um, I have a great story uh, from a Gen Con where we were at, uh, my friend was actually, going past the Haba booth and there were all these like college age kids standing around laughing and having a great time playing the game and he went over and was like what is that game it was Rhino Hero and if you don't know Rhino Hero it is just a very silly card stacking game you stack cards one on top of the other there's you know a few variances and stuff and my son loves that um teenagers love that I've heard it's a drinking game I don't know so um <laughs> I, but I mean like that's the kind of game watching. I'm sorry. Um, it's a milk drinking That's game. how you make any game a family game. <laughs> I didn't say that. So, <laughs> but, um, but, but yeah, I mean, to Sarah's point, yeah, that, that's a kind of company that I think really thinks about hmm. an adult is going to have to play this with a kid. And so how are they going to feel that? And how are they going to enjoy it? So mm-hmm. generally, I'll, I'll give a hobby game a try because I know that I'm not going to be bored. And I think he's going to enjoy it. Even mm-hmm. though he's getting a little older, even though he's getting a little older, he'll still occasionally want to play My First Orchard, uh, which you mentioned, and it is the very first game that he played with me. He calls it the Crow Game. Uh, any other family games people want to mention? Or I mentioned earlier family, the game but... Labyrinth is, I think, a fantastic yeah. one. They, they made a, a junior version of it. I don't think you need to get the junior version of it. I think the adult version is still pretty accessible. You may need to have an adult teach it as opposed to having the young person um, guide themselves through that process. But I remember okay. playing that game at a pretty young age. Um, another game for that everyone can play together, if, we, if you think about it, uh, storytelling games, Oftentimes, mm-hmm. there's a really easy access point for that. Mm-hmm. Um, a game that I would heartily recommend is called No Thank You Evil. Oh, yeah. It is a uh, we play collaborative, that. yeah, mm-hmm. it's a collaborative storytelling game, much like Dungeons and Dragons, um, but it is accessible for very young kids. It's got one six-sided die to roll. It's got tokens you can trade in to give yourself bonuses on rolls. And there's a very active uh, Facebook community around that, that people have been playing and having four-year-olds run the game for other kids, which is a That's really, great. really wow. cool. Thing, um, it's by Montico Games for anyone yes. who's looking for it. Good, good reminder on that. My um, five-year-old that loves that game. It's a fantastic game too. It's like the I'm like I want I need children so I can play that game. With. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm sure people have children you could borrow right yeah, now. You can borrow mine anytime. Too, so. <laughs> um, all right. So then the kind of last thing I just want to touch on is uh, in the last couple of minutes, uh, major uh, suggestions or tips, uh, kind of the key things to keep in mind when using a game for an educational purpose. Um, Be that uh, the way that you present the game, how you get make sure they get the most out of the learning, how you make sure you have fun, um, kind of whatever uh, your your top tip for uh, using games for education. I'm gonna put you all on the spot now. (laughs) I mean, I mean, my main thing is just if they're not having fun, uh, they're not gonna learn. So whether you have to put that game away and bring it out when they're older or a different day or whatever, you, know, you can't, it, I say, as I tell my son to do his homework, like you can't really force the learning, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, I would just say, you know, be flexible. If a rule is bothering them, you can take the rule out, you know, that you own the game, play it however you want, right? So, um, but you need to be flexible with it. You can't be like, we're playing Monopoly right now. And that's what we're doing. He's not going to love Monopoly, not that you learn anything from Monopoly, uh, but he's never going to want to play it again. Actually, that's a good idea. I'm going to remember that. But um, <laughs> yeah, no, I think about it. So if but, it's a game you never want to play, make sure you uh, make them play it all the time. Yes. Okay. Yeah. But but yeah, but that's my point is you need to be flexible. Uh, they're not always going to want to learn. They're not always going to want to play that game. So just go with it. 
I think one of the one of the best ways to um, help your kids learn whatever through a game is being really kind of clear and transparent with why you're making the choices that you're making. Mm -hmm. Um, And then and there are times with my son, too, where he'll make a choice in a game and I'll say, okay, like. If that's what you want to do, 100 percent do that, but know that the consequence of you doing that is going to be like this or that, like now you're not going to be able to do this, or now mama is going to be able to do this. And sometimes he's like, yep, I want to make it easy for you, mama, because I love you. And I'm like, great kid. Thanks. Like, I'm not doing that thing. Um, but like, so then he starts learning how to connect those dots on his own. And, you know, I'm modeling my own thinking through games in a way that's really transparent for him. And, you know, and I've played with older kids too, that, you know, teenagers, especially if they're learning a game or something, just makes it more fun for everybody. If you're like, okay, think about this for a second. Still want to do it. Great. Do it. But mm-hmm. there are other options. Nice. Any other last thoughts people want to share? I, uh, Marion stole mine around play. Oh. Um, I, I guess but, I, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, that's great. It was. It's important, <laughs> worth repeating yeah. again to remember to play. Um, but the the lasting advice I would give to people who are trying to use games for education is to think about think about not. You don't have to just use um, educational games, like I said earlier. So you can look at a game and consider what it's asking its players to do, and then figure out how to encourage those things by by playing alongside them. So if it's a reading game or a math game, those those are great. Uh, but if uh, all games include reading and math to a certain extent for the most part, and you can u- think about th- the way that those games, because of the task demands within the game, incentivizes the learning of those things. So my, my main advice to people who want to use games in an educational context is to play lots of games, mm. um, not just the educational ones, but lots of games. And remember that there's so much learning that can happen regardless of the game that you're playing. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, everybody. That kind of brings us to the end of our time. Uh, thank you everybody who's hanging out and chat. Uh, we will try, I say this and I can't promise to get a list of a lot of these games that we've mentioned uh, posted somewhere so that anyone who is curious about any of them can uh, dig into them themselves and the various suggestions. Uh, as a reminder, our schedule, join us next week. We will be back with Monday night with some board games with the Brothers Murph. We have this game gets dicey if you want to hang out with uh, Paula and Matthew as they play some board games online. Uh, at, and that is going to be at 1.30 p.m. followed by Fireside with Peter Atkinson where we're exploring the history of Dungeons and Dragons. And then we'll be back. Adam will actually be joining us again next week for another conversation. We're going to be revisiting uh, mental health and social isolation and socializing distance leave because we're we're still here uh so let's bring that back and let's talk about it a little more dive into some more topics and conversations and before that we have table takes which is our weekly news show uh so thank you so much everybody for being here um i will have all of you kind of sign off one last time and uh and then we'll we'll wrap up so kind of go around in a circle same as last time marion i'm Marion mcbride event manager at gen con uh just uh play games with your kids doesn't matter what game it is they'll learn something <laughs> um, Megan. Right. Again, Megan with Gen Con. Uh, and I just want to say thanks for joining us today. It's been a lot of fun. And I know personally that games for kids are my one of my favorite things to talk about. So we're always happy to be here as a resource at Gen Con to give you more information about games for kids. Awesome. Adam. Um, I want to say thank you to Gen Con for having me uh, on this stream. Uh, if you want to know more about game to grow you can uh, learn more at GameToGrow.org. We uh, run groups in the greater Seattle area, but we actually offer trainings and consultations to educators, uh, parents, and therapists around the country and around the world. You can find more about that at GameToGrow.org. And Sarah. Um, I'm Sarah. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for, thanks for watching and hope we were able to answer your questions and Stay strong with all those kiddos at home all day long. (laughs) Fun with that. Thank you so much, everybody, for being here, and we will see you next time. Bye.